Chapter 14. Steel Hoods. The stables were never meant to save any pony. Explosions. The world around me was rent apart by a cacophony of violent light and bombastic sound. Shocking heat followed a roar beyond the might of thunder. The twilight darkness was annihilated by too bright brilliance. Time slowed to a crawl, as if sensory overload was causing my brain to lag. Fire and shrapnel tore at me, sparks of pain igniting all over my body. The roar that filled the world died as a high-pitched whine as I lost my hearing. I was rooted in place, unable to make my body move. Blood spattered across my face as the pseudo-goddess standing in front of me tore apart, the parts of her body savagely flung in every direction. I felt myself thrown to the ground. Velvet Remedy covered me with her body, her shield forming around us with aching slowness. I could feel a sticky warmth as her blood seeped down and mixed with mine. Only belatedly did I realize that I was not the one being attacked. The second pseudo-goddess was turning, wide-eyed, as she brought up her own magical shield, but it was too late for her. The rapid-fire explosions that were killing Velvet Remedy and me just by proximity were ripping directly into the creature. The pseudo-goddess shield rippled, fluctuated, and died before it could fully manifest. She, too, was consumed in a mutilating blaze. Time snapped back as the rain of explosions momentarily stopped. My vision was wrapped with afterimages of the creatures, their obliterating bodies flash-burned into my sight. My ears still heard nothing but a distant, nauseating buzz. But now I could see the source of the massive attack, and I had seen this thing before. It was the poster from the recruitment center, come to life before us. A pony completely concealed in steel-grey armor, even its tail. It was a mighty relic from the war, a steel ranger. A bright lamp on its forehead spotlighted the target, and the huge gun on the right side of its monstrous battle saddle began to fire again. But the last pseudo-goddess had been given plenty of time to bring up her shield, as her sisters were being slaughtered, and the explosions, which I now saw were metal apples similar to those I had used on the dragon, only being fired at terrifying speed, detonated against her shield while she stood inside, looking cosy, unconcerned, and only mildly pissed. The flames illuminated her midnight blue coat and sickly green hair, and made her eyes sparkle like gateways to hell. Again the Steel Rage's grenade machine gun stopped, and now a large box on the left side of its battle saddle sprung open, unleashing two rockets, which arrowed through the air towards the creature, leaving contrails in their wake. The pseudo-goddess merely lowered her head, a spark of light bursting forth from her horn. In an instant, the two rockets had reversed course, the Steel Ranger tried to step back, but there was no time. The two rockets impacted directly into our armoured would-be saviour, the explosion tossing the massive body back down the hill. The grass erupted in smoke and dirt and flame as the tumbling body bounced over several mines before coming to a stop, motionless and seemingly lifeless at the foot of the shack below. Velvet's weight bore down on me. We waited for the Steel Ranger to get up, and the world seemed to wait with us. When, after long moments, it did not stir, the pseudo-goddess strode forward towards it. I could hear her laughter, even though my ears could hear nothing but an awful ringing. In the back of my mind, I realized I must have been right. Telepathy played a part in the pseudo-goddess' threat. See now how the so-called mighty alicorn hunter has fallen. The majestic and cruel voice of the pseudo-goddess purred in my head. The goddess will be most pleased. The impact of bullets created twin sparks on the pseudo-goddess shield. Limping and bloodied from the storm of fire and shrapnel, Calamity strode forward. I could see his mouth moving. Undoubtedly, he was saying something snide and witty. The pseudo-goddess, or Alicorn by her own title, turned and snorted derisively. Calamity shot again, to just as futile an effect. I shrugged my haunches, trying to tell Velvet Remedy to get off me, but she did not. Her body was warm dead weight. I realized our shield spell had dropped, and I felt a surge of panic. I heaved and rolled her off, and turned to find my beautiful companion unconscious, her hide flayed by shrapnel, bleeding excessively. With a flare of my horn, I opened one of her medical boxes, and started pulling out what supplies we had left. My heart screamed, seeing at how little it was. I may have screamed too, but I couldn't hear. I pulled open the other, hoping for more, but all that was left in the second medical box was her dress, a bottle of buck, and the party-time mintles. That voice in my head roared, 
Velvet Remedy was counting on me. She'd die if I couldn't help her. I needed to be smarter right now. I needed to be better now. I needed those mintles. The little memory orb rolled out and fell into the grass as I tore the tin of party dime mintles from her saddlebox and flirted it to me. A craving hit me, and I had to force myself to take only one. Make them last. One would be... The world became so much brighter, clearer, and cleaner. I was aware of each raindrop as it struck me. I was aware of each pain, each bleeding gash on my own body. My mind sped down pathways of thought. Once again, brilliant light burst all around us, this time carrying a choking stench of ozone as the alicorn summoned lightning from the thunderclouds and struck calamity to the ground. I turned, trying to cry out, but I had no voice. Or if I did, I could not hear it. Calamity shuddered, twitching on the ground. He was not dead, not even yet unconscious, but he was in no condition to fight. The alicorn didn't seem to care. A malicious smile broke over her features, cold and wicked as motes of pinkish-purple light ignited around her head, growing and shaping into magical arrows. I tried to get to my hooves, but my legs wouldn't work. A wave of nausea dropped me. I knew I too was suffering from blood loss, and the ringing in my ears was shredding my sense of balance. But I also knew that Calamity and Velvet were about to die. So might I, but I would die saving them. And in the sheer brilliance of mental enhanced acumen, I knew just how to do it. My telekinesis did not fail me, even when my body did. I brought my sniper rifle up to me as I simultaneously lifted the orb and floated it towards the alicorn, moving it so that it approached from her flank. I felt a pang of conscience, risking something so precious to Velvet. The pseudo-goddess turned, catching the movement out of the corner of her eye. She reached before she recognized it, expecting a grenade, focusing her magic against it and hurling it back at me. The memory orb glowed softly as the alicorn touched it with focused magic. Her eyes went wide her shield dropping and the forming cascade of magical arrows evaporating as the unicorn was lost inside the memory. Slipping into the targeting zen of sats, I lined up the headshot and pulled the trigger. No! Velvet Remedy intoned harshly, her voice sounding distant and muffled through the buzzing in my ears. She floated the tin of party time mintles away from me before I had a chance to take yet another. I'd taken two already, one before killing the alicorn, and a second to stave off the massive depression I knew would come when the first wore off. But I tried to come up with something that Velvet Remedy would buy. I was amazed now. I could talk anyone into anything. At least let me hold on to them. I might need them. And yet somehow, I couldn't convince the most beautiful mare in the wasteland to give me a tin full of medicine. I had administered the last of the medical potions to Velvet Remedy the magical liquid seeming to work achingly slowly at closing her wounds. Now she was left with just the healing bandages to aid Calamity and myself. We didn't have anywhere near enough. She was still very weak from loss of blood, and was having trouble standing. Calamity needed a medical brace to fix his leg. Velvet Remedy didn't want to risk a mending spell until it was properly set. More, he needed serious bed rest to cover from the lightning strike. There was one more. I had to wave Velvet Remedy back before I approached the unmoving armoured figure crumpled against the shack below. Harnessing my levitation, I could pass over the minefield safely. Velvet Remedy could not. Between the alicorn's thought words and the label my pit block had spontaneously given the shack, it didn't take party time mentals and enhanced smarts to realise that this had probably been Steelhoofs, the great alicorn hunter meaning that there were more of these, possibly a lot more. The thought was frightening. Steelhooves had exterminated two of them with a combination of surprise and epic firepower, but it was just by wits and luck that I had killed the third before she slew us all. Last time, I needed a boxcar. The creatures were not invincible, but they were powerful and very hard to kill. The Metal Stallion, or at least I assumed he was a stallion, based on the form of the armour, had not moved since the battle. I crouched down next to the fallen ranger, several of my bandages shifting and coming undone as I did so, my wounds oozing blood. Up close, the armour was even more impressive. It had its own air filtration system, complete life support, 
even mechanized drug injection, the damage from the rockets was far less than it had any right to be. Still, the armor had a cave-in at the point of impact, gruesomely crushing the pony inside. I tried to find a way to remove the helmet. If there was one, it was well concealed. But I found a jack point that would allow my pit buck to interface with the helmet's own arcane technology matrix. I pulled out a tool from my utility barding, already suspecting that the helmet included its own EFS and SATS equivalents, if not more. Whoever had designed the armor must have worked tail twined with tail alongside stable tech. Don't do that. The voice from inside the helmet was low, rumbling, exceptionally masculine. I stepped back, startled. There was some pony alive in there. Fueled by my party time confidence, I approached, trying to reassure him. I'm a certified stable tech pit buck technician, I lied, but only a little. I'm sure I can help. No, you can't, the voice spoke, but the body still did not move. The helmet did not even turn to look at me. My armor took a crippling hit. Everything is offline. Medical, self-repair, the entire spell matrix has crashed. I sat back on my haunches, wincing as several sharp bolts of pain lashed up through my flanks. Can you? Without magical power, I cannot even move. I will die here. I am truly already dead. The low voice in the armor sounded resigned to the idea, at peace with it. But I took them with me. And if I am not mistaken, I saved the stable dweller. As a final act, it was a good one. I was taken aback. My overblown reputation. A deep discomfort stirred inside me. It wasn't right for other ponies to risk their lives for me, thinking of me as something special. I stared at the Steel Ranger, not dead, but paralyzed. If the armor had no power, jacking into it wouldn't do any good. I looked back towards Velvet Remedy, wishing I had actually taken some time to learn about medicine from her, rather than just relying on her skills. I contemplated lifting her over the minefield. Turning back to the fallen, fallen pony, Okay, uh, steel hooves, right? How did you... Oh, of course. Of course what? Shaking off the confusion, I continued. I'm bringing our medic over. Without another word, I turned and focused my magic on Velvet Remedy. She floated into the air with a shocked eep. She started to float through the air towards us. Little Pip, put me down! Minefield, I said casually. Oh! Okay, move me, then put me down. A moment later, she had joined us. She gave me a ladylike nicker, and turned to look over the armoured hunter. As I informed her of what he had told me, my mind flashed to the poster I had seen on the wall of Candy's clinic. You don't have to be a steel ranger to be a hero. Join the Ministry of Peace today. I looked at Velvet Remedy, knowing she must be familiar with the same poster from somewhere, and wondered if she was remembering it as well. You need not bother, Steelhoofs insisted. There is nothing to be done. I have had a good gallop. Nonsense, Velvet Remedy neighed, brushing off the Steel Ranger's morbidity. Now we just have to get you out. No, the low, gravelly voice said again. Sorry? Velvet Remedy asked, confused. She had spent several minutes examining the armor, looking increasingly worried. Even if the armor protects you from the burns and slashes, you've suffered massive blunt trauma. The internal damage could... As she spoke, she began to wrap the armor in a soft, magical glow. Don't remove the armor. Velvet Remedy whinnied. Oh, please. I went through this with calamity. I can't treat you if I can't see you. If you remove my armor, I will die. I blinked, gasping at him, eyeing the huge dent crushing into his side. I didn't possess Velvet Remedy's medical insight, but I could imagine that the armor was the only thing holding him together. Velvet pulled back, cancelling her spell. Well, that seems like a design flaw. My armor is meant to keep me alive, Steelhoof said a touch defensively. Open the armor of my left flank. Velvet Remedy did so, revealing a system for administering drugs and medical potions. Everything from Buck to... I don't even recognize some of these drugs. Velvet said in surprise. The armor has a doctor enchantment. If it was working, I would be fully healed already. I was looking over the injection system, casually observing. It doesn't have a drug for party... 
Little Pip! The Velvet Remedy scolded, silencing me. I stepped back, cowed. I turned my mind from the drugs, instead focusing on the failure of the magically powered armor's spell matrix. If this was a Pip buck, I could easily... Wait! I blurted, already knowing exactly what to do. Velvet Remedy gave me a look. Little Pip? She hissed dangerously. I couldn't blame her. It had only been a second since I made that other observation. She didn't have any appreciation for how fast I could think right now. If she did, maybe she wouldn't be so fast to take my party time mentals away. No, I know how to fix him. I can restore power to the armor and reboot the spell matrix. I beamed. The suit designer obviously incorporated stable tech arcane technology. It's not that different from fixing a pip buck. Velvet's expression softened. Well then, don't just stand there, she smiled, backing out of my way, careful not to move closer to the minefield. I trotted forward and came crashing back to reality, recognition of my mistake mixed with the crushing depression that flooded me in the wake of party time mentals wearing off. In a moment, I was stupid, ignorant and dumb. I, I can't. But you just said... I don't have the tools. I felt like crying. The Steel Ranger was going to die, imprisoned in this armor, because I wasn't a certified stable tech pip buck technician. My utility barding didn't include a spell matrix master key. Reluctantly, I admitted as much. Vermit Remedy walked to me, wobbling a little, still faint from loss of blood. She wrapped her tail over me, whispering comfortingly into my ear. Spell matrix master key? The voice of Steelhoof sounded hopeful rather than resigned. You might be able to find one of those in Stable 29.